taking Darwin seriously is what many human-centric organisms employing their own kind of speciesism have been doing for some time now. This might sound overly sarcastic, however. This discussion will show why it is warranted. Therefore, please help me correct this biased scientific oversight and seriously ask what would really be the case if Darwin was right. I was activated to think about this when I was still at school, even long before our country's schooling system succumbed to the universalist claims of Darwinism and started to teach his dogmas. Since those early days, I have been searching for the correct response to this subject of Darwinism. After 30 years, I found the best response to an archetypical Darwinian claim from arch-Darwinist of our day, Richard Dawkins. Here follows a lengthy quote from Richard Dawkins' River Out of Eden, a Darwinian view of life. The total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. During the minute that it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive. Many others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear. Others are slowly being devoured from within by rasping parasites. Thousands of all kinds are dying of starvation, thirst and disease. It must be so. If there ever is a time of plenty, this very fact will automatically lead to an increase in the population until the natural state of starvation and misery is restored. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication. Some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. This quote from Richard Dawkins' River Out of Eden, a Darwinian view of life, is the archetype that made me realize how human-centric and misguided Darwin was. It is as if the 19th century Victorian mind could not distinguish its own misplaced biases and misplaced rage against God. What appears to be absent then, even today, within the biblical arguments that contributed to the debate regarding our human origins, is a purely unbiased scientific argument presented by scientists. Not just isolated biologists observing existing organisms in existing environments, but all scientists from all disciplines looking at actual physics and actual environmental properties. This strictly scientific argument, which I will discuss here, will demonstrate from first principles, i.e., without assuming the end state beforehand, that Darwin's theory cannot account for the persistence of any organism that is physically and statistically less optimal for survival in any purely natural environment. Without Darwin's bias, there seems to be no scientific backing for the existence of less probable life structures in nature that are less likely to succeed in achieving a purely mechanical, non-teleological survival. A common sleight of hand biologists make is to bring the teleology of niche environments into the argument. This is misplaced reasoning, and I will address it first to show that the world would certainly not look the way it does if Darwin was right. According to Darwin, pure survival implies that a species extracts energy from its environment and replicates. His theory is specific in its rejection of any other purpose or teleology, advocating pure, pitiless indifference, as Dawkins claims. Making an argument about any mechanically less adapted for survival organisms somehow being specifically better adapted for some kind of niche environments is bad logic, and it should be obvious if you are unbiased about what you actually mean by more probable 
to survive and niche environment. You have to let pure nature and physics decide, not your blind biased commitments to your own species. This is especially obvious if that so-called niche environment is made up of very purposeful novelties that will only exist if multicellular organisms already existed in the first place. Take, for instance, being able to respond to light or any sensory interaction with the environment, it must be more probable to lead to survival, not simply a novel thing to do. It should be obvious that single-celled organisms like bacteria already have the most optimal interaction with any energy gradient, i.e light and it is far more probable to survive not the novel expenditure on energy that lead ultimately to complex sight therefore natural environments are natural in the sense that they must be non-specific physical environments available for non-teleological darwinian life to be more probable to exist do not make unscientific claims about the wonderful consciousness and interactions we observe, as if it only exists for survival's sake, when in fact it exists for consciousness's sake, at the expense of optimal survival strategies, like those of bacteria. With this basic background, we can now do the thought experiment and realize if we accept Darwin's hypothesis as correct, solely based on scientific grounds. Without any human-centered bias, we should not anticipate the existence of any multicellular organism. Only viruses, bacteria, and those types of naturally more probable structures that align with actual materialism and Darwin's theory. Pure thermodynamics upholds this expectation in accordance with Darwin's stated theory. Multicellular and multi-organ organisms do not represent a Darwinian advancement in the survival of these already more probable species, regardless of any known physical environment or interactions. This is glaringly obvious to any scientist, an engineer who takes all of physics and mechanics into account. Simply think through the fact that Adding dependencies between cells and organs merely introduces unnecessary complexities and critical dependencies to any organism. And Darwin's process will get rid of them always and only allow the more probable to survive. According to current scientific understanding, pure nature should over time eliminate all needless dependencies and novelties that introduce potential failure points simply by not propagating them. This already should show you that Dawkins' idea of a Darwinistic world is far different from what I think through the unwarranted bias he maintains. Even single-celled organisms that rely on less probable or too novel strategies to extract energy and replicate do not constitute an improvement over the more probable and most reliable survival strategy. As such, they should not be favored by a godless Darwinian nature. Darwin's theory seems ill-equipped to accommodate less probable novelty, yet this is the very thing his theory endeavors to explain. It is puzzling why this seemingly irrational line of Darwinian reasoning is permitted to persist within the current debate about human origins. However, we do observe in nature that these far less adapted for survival organisms continue to thrive, and the variety of frailty is astounding. Diversity and novelty are burgeoning within our human experience. Not that my argument implies more optimal systems cannot be diverse. I think the single-celled ecosystem of organisms is close to optimally diverse as well. It is at this point that we have to admit that if humans are the worst survival organisms, then what are humans good for? Humans are uniquely suited for consciousness, relationships, abstract thinking, 
sensory observations and cooperation with more than just other humans. Yet astonishingly, we manage to survive within our delicate, complex bodies, especially when we compare our survival design properties to those of viruses and bacteria. This reality answers the question of what kinds of life should we expect if Darwin was right. We should only expect single-celled organisms, more likely to survive in any environment as well, even in space and alien planets. Yet here we are. Why is this the case, Mr. Darwin? Now, if we take leave of Dawkins' delusion and human-centric bias, then it seems as if God initially designed and created the optimal survival organisms just to prove a point to Darwin. God created the perfect nanomachines, mechanistically perfect, and then only he progressed to create those organisms with an escalating degree of novel consciousness of each other, his creation and himself. The conscious awareness of God appears to be the root of our survival. Certainly, not any natural process like Darwin proposed. Even looking at single-celled organisms' ability to sense other things as we see how these microbes are moving around just amazes any pure survival credulity. Because by now you must intuitively know that keeping locomotion optimized for energy conservation and not novel less optimal interactions is Darwin's only physicalist option. With this picture in mind, we find a much better sphere of inquiry about what we observe and can expose to science. For instance, what scientists and philosophers refer to as subconscious experiences might merely be another mode of operation for our kind of consciousness, similar to sleeping. Perhaps when we sleep, we draw closer to God. It's worth contemplating how vulnerable we are during sleep, yet we persist as a species, along with all other less optimal species on the spectrum of consciousness. If survival were the only factor at play, then sleep would certainly represent a design flaw, along with all other survival flaws. Consider that for most multi-organ, multicellular organisms, Sleep or dormancy presents a risk. Remember, if Darwin was right, then we have to measure our probability of pure mechanistic survival to that of single-celled microscopic organisms. There are even species of microbes that can survive for thousands of years by entering a dormant state. This obvious test put Darwin's theory, which I presented here, was well within the capability of any 19th century scientist the experimental identification of the probabilistically viable outcome of mutation and natural selection, or Darwinian probable organisms. The requisite experiments would merely need to determine which organisms most effectively interact, compete, cooperate and replicate, considering physical, chemical, mechanical and genetic informational metrics. In any environment capable of supporting any particular life form being tested, exposing any detrimental critical dependencies. It must be acknowledged, however, that during that era, understanding of the extreme survival capabilities and the optimal complexity and robustness of single-celled organisms was limited. While humans remain naively biased about their mechanistic capabilities and mastery over nature in general, they don't seem to acknowledge their physical, chemical, mechanical and genetic or informational inferiority. May we find our way back to what God intended for us to be, the conscious and cooperating human beings that is able to do the science of agency. Let us acknowledge God's agency in nature before bacteria-like machines of our own making destroy humanity. And, because I am in a continuous process of rejecting the mechanistic Darwinian outlook on all I perceive in nature, I am certain that God's restoration of humanity in Jesus Christ will always be successful. It is almost as if Dawkins wants to admit that much, but his pride might still be his downfall.